let's pray together and then we will jump into God's Word. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you in this place this morning. Thank you, Lord, for family, that we are the family of God and that you place us in families. And as we come to your word now, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Speak, Lord, we're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the surprising findings of the EFC, the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada Parenting Faith Report that will be published in the middle of next month is that parents who rarely attend church are more confident about nurturing their children's faith than parents who regularly attend church. Yes, you heard me correctly. You don't need another coffee. Parents who attend church sporadically are more likely to believe that they're doing a good job in the faith forming of their children than parents who come to church time. Really? How does that figure? Well, psychology helps us understand that anomaly. There's a theory called the Dunning-Kruger effect that postulates, and I quote, that those who lack knowledge or skill in certain areas tend to overestimate their own competence, and conversely, those who do have skill and knowledge tend to underestimate their competence. Here's another fascinating finding. In the 2021 Multinational Children's Ministry Report, many children's ministry pastors say that most parents don't know how to nurture their children's faith. They also say that most parents expect the church to cultivate their children's faith. And even though they know their responsibility, they're happy in many instances, hand it off. Wondering about all of this as we come to think about this morning, Fostering faith formation. Have Christian parents abdicated their duty to nurture their children's faith? Have church leaders fostered a leave it to the expert mentality and usurped the parents' role? Or has a consumer culture blinded us to our God ordained? responsibility. Well, let's turn to God's Word for some answers to these questions. If you have your Bibles with you, open those up. If you've got one of these with you, open that up and go to the New International Version because that's what I'm going to read from this morning. There are more than 800 English versions of the Bible, so I've got to set you onto the right one. And go to the book of Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the fifth book from the start, and chapter 6, and we're going to read the first nine verses. While you're looking that up, I need to say this. I am here to bring a commentary on this text. The commentary. The word we are going to read now, God's holy word, 
is the most important word that you'll hear out of my lips as I read it. And so we honor him. Listen as I read this word. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Deuteronomy 6 marks a new beginning for a whole generation of people. As Moses begins to speak, I can picture the people hanging on every word. These are the words that become what forms the nation of Israel and guides it for generations to come, even to this day. In fact, the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord is one, is the centerpiece of Judaism. But these words are not just for the Jewish nation. They are no less essential for us as we are gathered here today. For these words are God's blueprint for passing the baton of faith from one generation to the next. Fast forward to today. Do you have children, grandchildren, or maybe even for some of you, great-grandchildren? Right now, as you're sitting here, pull up their names. Just start running those names through your head. I've got 11 grandchildren. I was praying for each of them by name as I was driving up from Uxbridge this morning. Pull them up. The names of your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Picture where they live. What they might be doing right now. Now turn to a person next to you and just share the name of one of those people you were thinking about. Just share that name quickly. Different generations. My family line goes all the way back to a guy called Adam and his wife Eve. Yours does too. 
I guess that makes us relatives. But we're not here for a family reunion this morning. We're here to examine God's Word and consider its application for us right here, right now. Let's unpack that Deuteronomy 6 passage that we read. The first thing I want us to look at is this, that faith formation involves everyone. The context of the Deuteronomy 6 passage are three little words that we sometimes miss. Hear, O Israel. Don't skip over those three words. The message of Deuteronomy 6 is for a whole nation and people, not just a targeted segment. It's for the whole faith community. Reaching and equipping successive generations to love and live for Jesus involves everyone. No exceptions. It includes youth with younger siblings, young adults at university, empty nesters like my wife Karen and I, although I'm not quite sure we're empty nesters because my nearly 95-year-old mother-in-law has lived with us for about 30 years. Senior sister citizens. And even for Pastor Ben as he watches online from home and the leaders of this church, everyone, there are no exceptions. We all have a part to play. God never intended children's faith formation to be the sole responsibility of their parents and maybe a secondary responsibility of their grandparents. We're all in it together. Not somebody else's job to connect the children with Jesus and his story. God needs you, and you, and you, and those who are watching online. So I ask, and I'm wondering, are you connected with a child in your church? According to the evangelical uh, polling firm, the largest polling firm in the world, the Barna Group, Children are three times more likely to read the Bible independently, obey the Scriptures, and rank church attendance as the high point of the week when they have meaningful relationships with one or more people in their church. Wow. It's not programs that change people's lives. It's people. Everyone has a part to play. Everyone. Second thing that I see in the text is this. Faith formation starts with me. The object of the Deuteronomy passage is our hearts. In verses 5 and 6 we read there, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your heart. Now the biblical definition of the heart means the totality of my being. Many people read that and they think it simply means emotions, not how the Bible uses that word. It means all of my thoughts and desires and affections and imaginations, my reasoning powers, my intentions, everything that makes me who I am. 
To love the Lord your God with all your heart is to love Him with your emotions, your intellect, and your will. Now, I like how Eugene Peterson paraphrases these verses in the message. He says this, he says, Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside your children. Oh, isn't that good? If God's Word isn't branded on my heart, there's no way I can impress it on my children's hearts. But when my faith is authentic, it endorses what I teach my children and grandchildren. Listen up, mums and dads. The best gift you can give your children is your love for Jesus. Take your phones out. Please and thank you. Turn it on. Usually we're telling you, turn it off. We're going against the flow this morning. Turn it on. And I want you to send a message to yourself, if you don't know how to do that on your phone. Send it to your spouse. It's always fun to tell somebody else how they should be walking with the Lord. So you're welcome to send this to your spouse. And, and type in a message now. The best gift I can give my, and then put your son or daughter or grandson or grandson's daughter in name in there. The best gift I can give name is my love for Jesus. Type that in. Nothing like getting a message from yourself that reminds you of what's really important. Fostering faith formation, number one, is for everyone. Number two, it starts with me. And number three, faith formation is a journey. The journey. The outworking of this Deuteronomy passage is a process. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7, what I like to call the great priority, we speak about the great commandments and the great commission. I wish we would add this as the great priority. And it says, impress them, talking about the Scriptures, impress the Scriptures on your children. I like how the New Living Translation uh, deals with that little word impress, that verb. The New Living Translation says, again and again. Faith formation isn't a one-off exercise, nor can it be compartmentalized. Faith formation is a 24-7 ongoing Morning, noon, and night activity. Wondering how we doing with that? How we journeying with this business of forming the faith in the next generation? My youngest son will soon be in his thirties, and his older siblings will soon be in their forties. My three children and their tremendous spouses, as I've already mentioned to you, have blessed me with 11 grandchildren. But my responsibility to nurture their faith formation did not end when they got married, when they moved out of the home. Karen and I are obligated biblically, for the rest of our lives until we draw our dying breath, 
to equip and encourage our children and their children to follow Jesus. There's no retirement from passing on our faith to the upcoming, to the successive generations. We're to do it naturally and normally whenever and wherever we can. I like the way Moses in the text describes the process. He uses opposites to draw attention to this. He speaks about while we sitting and while we walking, while we lying down and while we getting up to indicate that any time is suitable for talking about the Lord. Fostering faith formation shouldn't be complicated. There are three simple things that we can all do. And the text tells us what they are. Number one, talk about Jesus in the home. Even the busiest families sit down to eat a meal together. Research indicates that when a family eats a meal together at least five times a week, they build strong and enduring family bonds. Prioritizing table time nourishes our children's faith and spiritual growth. The kitchen table, certainly in our home when our children uh, were at home, were places where we connected around God's Word every day, interactively, experientially. And as my children would tell, would tell you if they were here, it's where we grapple to understand and to dig into the Word and to ask the tough questions and to build a biblical worldview that we could live by. To talk about Jesus the home. Secondly, talk about Jesus and His Word in the car. Now, the text says, while you're walking along the road, I didn't see anybody walking along the road on my trip here this morning. But I saw quite a lot in cars. I love the fact that when my kids or grandkids are in the car with me, they're a captive audience. I put a big smiley face in my notes. Just thinking about how cool that is. They can't escape me. To use your trips together in your vehicle to share what God is doing in your life. Use those trips to teach about the things of God. To tell them the stories about God's works and wonders in your life. To raise questions and debate issues and pray together. Only one caution, don't close your eyes if you're driving and praying. And then thirdly, talk about Jesus in the bedroom. Before we go to bed or get up in the morning, are great times for reflection and contemplation. Family ministry specialist Phil Bell says, and I quote, For the most part, children just seem to be more spiritually sensitive and a lot more open at bedtime. So fostering our children's faith isn't a complicated, big deal kind of thing. We must keep our eyes open for teachable moments and bring faith into our daily lives. We must talk about Him in the home, as we drive along in the car, and as we retire or start off the day. Fourthly, faith formation is deliberate. It's something that needs to be deliberate. The whole context of this Deuteronomy passage is one of intentionality. I love how verses 8 and 9 say, Tie them 
as symbols, them referring to God's Word, the Scriptures, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, Orthodox, devout uh, Jewish uh, believers, take that text literally. They will tie a phylactery around their forehead. It's a little box and it's got the Shema inside there. Or they'll have a mezuzah that they've nailed to their doorpost. And again, a little uh, metal uh, piece with the Scriptures inside of that. But I don't think God intended these verses to necessarily be applied that way. What he does want is for families to have practices and priorities that deliberately keep Jesus and his word at the forefront of everyday activities. I'm wondering as we sit here this morning and as you just think about this, what are some of the practices and priorities in your home? for impressing the Scriptures on your children and grandchildren? What are the things that you do? Catholic author Life Kerwalt views family life as revolving around ritual, routines, and rhythms. He uses those three R's in his writings. He recognizes that a child's faith formation requires a structured environment. And creating a structured environment in the home is absolutely essential. If there's disorder in the home, if there's disharmony, children are focused on survival. But with order in the home... Children are more likely to reflect on their feelings and their identity, which are critical factors in faith formation. So don't compartmentalize faith formation from daily living. Create intentional moments. Create traditions and experiences that integrate Jesus and His Word into your family's everyday lives. Well, let's move towards wrapping up. But just before we do, three important implications that I see in this text. Number one, God wants parents to take the primary role in fostering their children's faith formation. The primary role. Research came out a few years ago that indicated that our children in North America who are in Christian families, on average, attend 1.7 church services a month. Added up, that means the average Christian child in Canada gets 24 hours of church a year. One day. If a church says they are discipling your children, they are lying. You cannot disciple a child in 24 hours a year. That said, research also tells us that the average parent interacts with their ch child or children for more than 3,000 hours a year. So, duh. Sorry, are you allowed to do that in church? <laughs> Who's the one that needs to be forming the child's faith? The Holy Spirit working in and through the parents. Secondly, God wants the community of faith, the local church, all of us sitting here this morning, 
or in my case, standing, we are to take a supportive role in fostering children's faith formation. And who's to do that? The teachers who are downstairs, yes? Or no? Tell me, yes or no? Don't be shy now. What was the first point? No, the second point? No, what was the first point? First point. Losing track of my points here. Who's responsible for doing it? All of us. All of us. Thirdly, God wants us to foster faith formation. Why? Just in case we haven't got this point. So that we, our children, and our grandchildren will respect and love the Lord as long as we live. That's the first eight verses of Psalm 78. It's all about that. I want to ask you, are you hearing God's Word this morning? Thank you. One is. It's always wonderful when there's one brother to encourage the preacher. Listen, not enough to hear. We have to listen. And to listen is to act on what we've heard. So what do you need to act on? What has the Holy Spirit impressed on your heart and mind this morning? What is the one thing you are going to do when you leave here today? Apart from driving home. What is it? Don't miss the opportunity to pursue what God prioritizes. Don't miss out on the wonderful gift of giving yourself for the good of others. Successive generations need you to tell and teach them about the phenomenal God whom we know and love. This generation, I always get so sad when I have to tell the church this. Listen up, church. This generation of children in Canada are more disconnected from Jesus and His Word in the local church than any previous generation in the history of this nation. Don't keep the Lord to yourselves. Don't hinder, which we tend to do by inactivity, the children from coming to Jesus. Generation Alpha, that's the children that started being born from 2010, when I started working with Scripture Union, need you to connect them with Jesus and His Word. Tell them about Him. Turn to the person next to you and say, a child needs you to help them grow up with Jesus. A child needs you to help them grow up with Jesus. That's a powerful thought, isn't it? A child needs me. A child needs you to help them grow up with Jesus. Don't insulate or isolate yourself from God's purpose for your life. What was the name again of that younger family member that I asked you to bring to mind earlier? Just pull it back up again. Pull it up. I believe the Lord's given you that name this morning for you to act on. Each one should reach one. 
God wants you to tell the next generation the stories about what God has done in your life, to answer questions about faith, and to live a life of faith. Fostering the faith formation of the next generation matters. Big time. In the power of the Holy Spirit, not in our own strength. Let's bring the little children to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you for this word for us this morning. And this family day weekend. We ask you, Lord... To help each of us to excel in the faith formation of successive generations. Lord, forgive us for where we've come up short. Fill us with your Spirit. Incline our hearts and minds to doing this. Bring it to our attention. In the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. So we are constantly looking for opportunities to share our love for you and to live it out before our children and grandchildren. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Impress it on our hearts, even as we seek to impress it on the hearts of others. For your name's sake. Amen.